folks have filtered into the uh, intimate room here um, that we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And um, so I'm Robert Esker. I'm the product manager for, for OpenStack at NetApp. I probably should have asked uh, if everyone here parlez, parlez vous anglais, but uh, you probably respond in French. I wouldn't understand what you're saying, so I apologize I have to speak in, in English. Je ne comprends pas français. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about OpenStack and NetApp and what we're up to, the way we look at it, uh, some of our development effort, more or less the state of the union, or state of the art rather, uh, with OpenStack and NetApp. So um, we're part of a, uh, our OpenStack development is part of a, a group, a NetApp called Cloud Solutions Group, where we're looking at enabling a common data fabric across multiple different endpoints, you know, to try and solve one of the uh, as of yet not fully solved problems of hybrid cloud, which is fundamentally the movement of data. You know, it's the thing that's least like a power utility. It's, you've probably heard the metaphor several times. Data has gravity, data, data um, has inertia, it's hard to move data comparatively, whereas you know, compute, turn on a light switch, network, turn on a light switch. And so um, in starting uh, down this path, we, we looked at what's within NetApp's uh, portfolio of products. Uh, fundamentally, there's a, a thing that most folks uh, associate with NetApp called Data on Tap. It's the storage operating system that has been classically associated with the hardware that we produce. Uh, and that is the same operating system that exists in all models of the, of the FAS line, of, of the things, again, that NetApp has historically uh, um, you know, had success with. Uh, we're doing some things, we'll get into a little bit more detail here in a second, that kind of change the context where we can deliver data on tap, and it sort of starts to grow beyond those physical pieces of hardware. Uh, but it's a great place to start in building a common data fabric, because if you're familiar with Metcalfe's law, any given network is only, and I'm paraphrasing, as powerful as the number of nodes within it. You know, the more nodes within a network, the more powerful generally it is. Uh, so, so data on tap is actually the, you know, by most measures, the number one most common commercial storage operating system in the world. Not claiming NetApp is the largest uh, provider of storage in the world, we're not. But because all of our platforms have historically been delivered with this common OS, when you actually measure it, we're the most widely deployed single storage operating system. So it's a good place in starting to build a fabric. When you start layering on top of that, that we're, I believe it's a, over 200, and some of the folks in the room here could probably confirm uh, different service providers in the world have built services uh, that are underpinned by NetApp capabilities, uh, then you start to fill out this notion of a common data fabric. Well, that's only one part of the picture, and so where does like OpenStack fill into that? Well, commonly we're seeing folks deploy OpenStack on-prem to facilitate a hybrid cloud model. You know, certainly I wanted to build my own set of capabilities that are AWS-like. Maybe I don't necessarily intend to do business with AWS, but increasingly developer tools expect like an S3 or an EBS or an EC2 endpoint. And so you can levy that, up, of course, against an OpenStack uh, implementation. So increasingly, OpenStack sort of starts to resemble that common infrastructure as a service control plane. And it's not always necessarily the open source bits themselves, the reference implementation. So, you know, for example, you'll see depicted here, if you're familiar with the icons, Azure. Uh, Microsoft's on record at saying, we'll start actually over time, one of their product managers, uh, stating that we'll start supporting uh, 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 API, OpenStack API endpoints on our, on our services, which isn't to say they're building Azure with OpenStack or intend to do so, but rather that you, know, you can actually write code against an OpenStack API and, and, and run it against an Azure um, hosted capability. So we're seeing that kind of across the board. Uh, there was a, a contribution, I think it's a bit old now, uh, at least nine months old, um, wherein there was shims provided for, um, you know, the basic shims for Google, Google Compute Platform, wherein in the same way that you can actually, you know, you know levy uh, uh, application logic that was intended to be delivered against AWS against an OpenStack because of shimmed APIs, you can actually do that with some subset of the Google Compute Platform capability. And that's actually in, in I believe, Stackforge. It po might possibly have made it into uh, some of the upstream open source, uh, open, open stack projects on GitHub as well. So increasingly, we're seeing it being the choice of, you know, uh, or there's the, the various hyperscale providers, the largest sort of providers of, of uh, uh, public infrastructure as a service capabilities. And there's a collection of others that sort of have that ambition, a number of whom are actually building 
uh, op uh, their public cloud capability, in this case of Rackspace, hpcloud.com, uh, SoftLayer has elements of it. Likewise, they're actually wrapping some of their capabilities with something called, I believe it's called JumpGate, which is a way of you know, taking their existing compute as a service capability and making it accessible as a, you know, via the Nova API. But similarly, also deploying Swift. So increasingly, OpenStack is that sort of common control plane, either in ad addressing everything through the native OpenStack APIs or through OpenStack's ability to actually uh, um, uh, function as an alternative, some of these other capabilities through its own API shims, or in the, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, some of these other existing functioning as a service capabilities themselves wrapping themselves with an OpenStack API shim. This, this looks like over time, it might become the standard control plane across hybrid clouds. You know, we shall see, it might not be the only one, but you know, as standard as we can hope for. And not standards through some you know, standards body that's ratified, but, but through ubiquity, through common deploy deployment. And of course, um, you know, any of the different flavors of, of OpenStack clouds that you might deploy on your own prem or in a hosted capacity or none of the boutique sort of IaaS capabilities that might not be depicted here. So just a little bit more about what I'm referring to if you're not already aware, you know, just a selection of some of the OpenStack projects and, you know, their equivalence amongst AWS, uh, it goes both ways. It, you know, you can, of course, uh, address OpenStack directly via its native APIs, these individual services native APIs. Likewise, you could, uh, you know, have intended against, to, uh, to deploy against AWS and maybe you need to repatriate for reasons of economics. Or perhaps it's that classic hybrid scenario of bursting out uh, for, for peak lopping, you know, for that once or twice a year. So... Uh, kind of deviating from that sort of, I'll come back to it in just a second. I just want to talk about like, well, how is NAP involved with, with OpenStack and, you know, by what means? Uh, the reality is, is we started in open source. Um, that data on tap operating system referred to is derived of BSD. And we regularly have kind of a push-pull relationship. We'll push stuff into it and likewise sync our, our own sources with it. Uh, we've been involved in a number of different places and we were the first major storage vendor to have participated uh, in the OpenStack community, having provided, having joined signed the corporate contributor agreement, um, having provided upstream integrations, having been a charter member of the foundation at the gold level, which is sort of depicted here as well. Uh, so not only have we been involved for a while, we've actually had a chance, um, having been involved as, we, as long as we have, to have matured some of our capabilities. Most of our upstream integrations, most of our integrations started around Cinder. We'll get into a little bit more detail about that in just a second. And I'm gonna move very quickly, so I apologize how fast I'm gonna be talking. Um, certainly be available to answer any questions afterwards. So the place we start with our platforms is to make sure that any of their distinguishing characteristics, any of the things that they do well, are, are not uh, hidden by the abstractions, by the service layer that an OpenStack capability provides. We have customers uh, who, who will use something like uh, uh, Cinder independently of the rest of OpenStack because they desire a single standardized block storage abstraction. Uh, and you know the modular, generally modular nature of OpenStack allows for that. There are certainly caveats, um, but you know, and that makes sense from from a deployer perspective. I don't want to have to like rewrite my application deployment logic against a different backend and a different proprietary API if I decide to swap out backends or have multiple backends that are appropriate for different workloads or use cases or SLAs. Uh, so makes sense to write against the Cinder API. That, that's the that standard abstraction. But as an abstraction, it also isn't terribly nuanced in its understanding of distinguishing characteristics of individual storage systems. So the first place we start in providing integrations is to make sure that the things that you know, are generally useful and interesting and different about NAP systems are accessible in the context of OpenStack, aren't hidden by the abstractions. I'll get about into how we'll do that in a second. You know, so that's, that's what I'm seeing here. So uh, going back again to this notion of the data fabric and data on tap, um, clustered on tap is kind of the latest evolution of that. It's not quite true. I'll talk about why in just a second. Um, and it has the ability to scale out. Probably the better way of referring to it is scale out on tap. It's the ability to you know, take a single capability, a single namespace, a distributed characteristic, and, and scale it horizontally. Uh, it, it, actually, you can scale it both vertically and horizontally. Um, and what we're trying to depict, and it's a little bit abstract here probably in the way it's depicted, 
is uh, that ONTAP can actually reside atop, of course, NetApp hardware, which is what's classically understood. It can exist atop um, three of our Flex Array flavor of hardware, which basically functions as a gateway to other third-party storage. You can take the capabilities of ONTAP and apply it to some of our competitors' arrays on top of that. And likewise, one the newest addition here, and this was just announced last week, is something called Cloud on Tap, which is basically on tap as an instance in a public cloud. Uh, and so, well, why is that interesting? Well, you get all of the capabilities of data on tap, its ability to you know, support multiple different protocols as a storage server, all of its storage efficiencies, but probably the most interesting characteristic, characteristic of it with respect to like enabling a hybrid cloud is its thin replication. It's well, under, you know, well known and well hardened and established replication capability, something we call Snap Mirror. So you have the ability to actually take workloads and move it from your on-prem to a hosted provider to, to an EC2, you know, to provide that same data set in as thin a possible way across, in terms of network utilization, as thin a way as possible to your EC2 instances or to your instances in any number of different public or private clouds. And so um, this is how we're starting to build out that notion of a common data fabric. So cluster, I'm sorry, I thought I heard a question. So let's talk about a little bit about the OpenStack integration more specifically. Uh, the first place I mentioned we started uh, was with block storage. I'm going to talk about image, images, so Glance, uh, because actually we didn't have to start. It just automatically worked. Uh, so there's two basic options for deploy, deployment of Glance. If you're not already familiar, there's a file, and then there's also a, a object storage backend. Uh, it, it turns out that unless you're deploying, uh, you have images that you know immense in number, there's a lot of additional complexity, complexity in deploying Swift if that's really the only use case for Swift. Now, it may very well be that you have a generalized object storage requirement and you also want to host your images there. That could make sense. But if the only thing you're really wanting to do is deploy um, a, uh, you know, a, 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 a compute as a service capability, frankly, using the file backend is far more efficient. It makes a lot more sense. And what you basically get is automatically the benefits of deduplication. Now, there's some other reasons to use this, which I'll explain in more detail in a, in a second, that has to do with our cloning technology. But it's not at all uncommon, given that these are operating system bits, to see you know, 90 plus percent deduplication rates. Again, there's a lot of commonality from one image type to another. So this is just an automatic quality you got um, out, out of the gate. <clears throat> Excuse me. So moving on to uh, object storage. Um, the first thing, I, there's a couple things that we, I want to talk about here. So first of all, there is Swift itself, the reference implementation, you know, the open source capabilities described in depth here at this, at this summit. Um, and what we do is we take one of our platforms, the thing I haven't been talking about to date, which is, a, is something called E-Series, and we take a, a unique characteristic of it and take the 3x storage consumed by default in Swift's consistent hashing ring scheme. This is how it protects data. And we reduce it to 1.3x via a parity scheme. But you might ask, well, well, I've heard that you can't use RAID with Swift. And that's probably a generally true statement that it's not typically a good choice, not typically viable. And the reason for that is that um, you know, you're commonly deployed in a capacity optimized manner. You're using largest possible spinning disks you know, six terabyte drives emerging now into the market. I don't know what the numbers are, but I know in the four terabyte range, certain scenarios, a rebuild could take, you know, upwards of 100 plus hours. And when you look at like the number of spindles that you might be deploying in a given sort of, uh, you know, RAID set, if you will, um, you, and you just kind of like do the basic math around mean, mean time between failure, you might need to actually plan to run degraded full time, given the use case of, or the common sort of profile of, of Swift. Uh, the way it's deployed. Um, so it's, it becomes not untenable. I mean, because that rebuild time basically means you're running degraded, which means less protected and performance degraded as well. So we have a kind of a cool trick up our sleeves with something called dynamic disk pools. If you're familiar with Crush, and I imagine this crowd, there's a fair number of folks who are, uh, we use that same academic work, use that algorithm and deploy it within our, within our E-series systems uh, to, to deliver what's essentially a declustered RAID and long story short is the number is anywhere between 5 and 10% of the time it would otherwise take to do a rebuild we can do with our dynamic disk pools capability. This is the thing that uses Crush. And so it mitigates that problem. And now you can, again, effectively use 
a, uh, an e-series that you can effectively use a parity scheme, a RAID system, if you will, to protect the data and make it immediately consistent, which is a quality that Swift itself doesn't immediately have. It's an eventually consistent model. And the, the numbers work out to be about 1.28x for protection within a single site. And clearly, very commonly, you're actually architecting to actually protect against site failure. Um, so you'll have other copies elsewhere. This doesn't solve for that basic problem, but it certainly reduces the number of copies that needs to be held in any given site. So a common case would be at 5x, five total copies of a given object uh, in order to protect it against site failure. You would usually want minimum of two at the remote site so that if you do have a failure, you don't have to reconstitute it across the WAN. So that 5x compresses to about 2.6x if you're using these series on both ends. And that helps you scale more broadly and saves you money on operational costs, environmental costs as well. So this is just depicting how it shrinks. Apologies, I, I got off, off script with my slide here. <laughs> So, uh, block storage. Again, I referenced earlier, this is actually where we started. Um, we started with uh, a, a classic mode of that data on top operating system called seven mode, because that's what, you know, at that point in time, is still the case. Uh, the critical mass of deployed system in the world are actually using. Uh, cluster on tap is probably a better architectural mesh with the design center for OpenStack itself. But again, you know, seven mode works. A lot of folks, uh, you would like to actually use it in the deployment OpenStack, and so we facilitated that. We moved on very quickly to cluster on tap. We, deploy, we offer a lot of different options uh, in terms of like providing the capacity through the block storage service. The, um, the thing that probably is confusing when you first see this is NFS. Um, we're talking about block storage. What, what is the relevance there? And the basics of it are that the common use case for Cinder is you're providing persistent storage to either boot an instance or to you know, add ad hoc capacity to an, and persistent capacity to an instance. So in that scenario, we can rely upon the mediating effect of a component called libvert, if you're familiar with it, and the hypervisor itself. Long story short, we are mounting NFS to the compute node, which is where the hypervisor lives, and files end up being tried, treated as virtual block devices, unbeknownst to the instance. So it, all it knows is that's a block device, and I'm you know, going to interact with it as expected, the, the guest virtual machine. Um, and the reason why we do this, and to be clear, we support iSCSI as well, I'll explain that in a second, um, is it's vastly more scalable than, than iSCSI is. iSCSI, you, in any given storage system, you're going to run out of LUNs and initiators well before you're going to hit any sort of logical limit associated with number of files in a given export. A common case, question we hear is, yes, but I think of NFS as kind of shared storage in a single sort of fan-in problem. Except for that when you combine it with clustered on tap, you're able to actually like supply multiple different storage servers inside of a single namespace. And with parallelized NFS, you can parallelize that I.O. such that it becomes more of a distributed characteristic and it mitigates any sort of that fan-in problem that you might classically associate with NFS. Um, now, that said, we do support iSCSI. For those who might be familiar with Ironic, or perhaps actually the use of Cinder outside of the context of the rest of OpenStack, where you're vending block devices to non-virtualized entities or non-managed entities, you need to actually supply something that can be mountable in a you know, sort of commonly understood way, like supports iSCSI mount semantics. So we, we do, of course, support iSCSI as well, and we try to treat them as much as peers as possible. But for scale considerations, NFS tends to be the better choice. Um, we did add in iSCSI support to our E-series systems, uh, and you'll see Fiber Channel layered in over this next release and possibly uh, not fully complete until the second release to the, uh, to the uh, L release, if you will, after Kilo. So one of the things that we did, I talked about this earlier, about making sure that none of NetApp's distinguishing characteristics can be hidden by the abstractions that the block, this OpenStack services present, is we developed, and we, this is an activity within the community, this notion of a storage, ser or a, um, yeah, a storage service catalog, essentially. Uh, and what you basically can do, uh, and I'll actually move ahead to this, well, you can, you can you know, deliver any number of different things to your tenant base. You, know, you can define it. This is arbitrarily defined, red, blue, green, uh, you know, whatever it is that makes sense here, we're depicting different types of uh, workloads uh, that might make sense to make a catalog available to. And so these are composed, these, these by the way, in Cinder parlance are called volume types, these catalog entries. And you compose them with unique characteristics of a given Cinder backend. Uh, so, you know, for example, perhaps archival is, you know, compressed, 
perhaps it's deduplicated aggressively, perhaps it's on you know, big, slow SATA spindles, something to that effect. And you know, perhaps it's the data pace is on uh, all flash. Um, you know, perhaps it's replicated because you have high uptime and DR type requirements, that type of thing. Uh, but you get to administratively, the deployer of the OpenStack cloud, the center administrator, if you will, uh, define what this catalog looks like. This is just a quick sort of depiction. Here we have a case where um, uh, we've basically established um, a volume type and QoS specs um, for a gold, silver, bronze type of capability. And uh, this is just depicting via horizon somebody actually selecting when they want to, hey, give me a cinder volume, I'll select the volume type. Uh, I, I won't bore you with the whole demo and I'm kind of running out of time. So you can see they selected gold and gold happened. Well, let's say if gold um, was, uh, let's say in this case, they selected silver. Silver in this case is defined as having a replication relationship. The container is automatically replicated. Hey, give me eight instances that are booted from volume of type silver. Uh, silver happens, uh, it's, it's, you know, the instances are created and it's created in a container that is automatically replicated perhaps to a DR site. Just an example of the type of thing you could, you could accomplish. And you know, the, the key there is offering the flexibility to build the catalog the way it makes sense for use cases. So moving on to uh, uh, some of the optimizations we did with both Glance and Cinder, in particular for the cases of creating instances. Um, so by default, if you're not familiar, when you create a virtual machine uh, in OpenStack, in, in Nova, it's what's referred to as ephemeral, which means that it's not, there's no guarantee of data being retained over a boot cycle. You should assume that it won't be retained. And it tends to be actually be you know, entirely booted off of the local disk on the compute node. So it's problematic to do things like live vi uh, migration of an instance, running instance from one place to another. So when you use Cinder's boot from volume capability and you use it with NetApp Cinder drivers, uh, uh, the, the data on tap Cinder drivers, you actually get a different characteristic. So one, those instances are by default ephemeral, you, or I'm sorry, persistent. You can call, treat them as ephemeral if you so desire. There's just a flag you select. Um, the instances come up much, much faster because you don't, have to cr um, you don't have to copy the boot image bits all the way down to the compute node upon first boot of that instance image type. We actually clone from Glance. So if Glance is on the same volume on the NetApp, and when I say volume, I'm referring to a NetApp flexible volume, not a cinder volume. If Glance is on the same flexible volume as the capacity store for cinder is, we'll just immediately clone it. Now, if it's not and it's elsewhere resident on our cluster, we'll do something called copy offload, which means we'll copy it across the cluster interconnect in our storage system. It doesn't have to wash it through the, the host running the cinder backend. And if that doesn't exist, perhaps actually Glance is in a, a based on Swift or something to that effect, we'll copy it out once and we'll cache it. Now, in fact, uh, Nova does that as well, but it, it's atomic to the compute node. So your cache is only as big as, as what is cached on your compute node. When we cache it, it's global to your entire fleet of hypervisors. Uh, and so instances come up much faster. They're, if, uh, they're immediately storage efficient until there's a net new write, a net new diff of any form from the original you booted, um, and they're persistent, and it facilitates live migration. And for some folks, it also allows them to boot their compute nodes stateless, meaning like I don't want local disk in them, if that's something you care about. So that's, that's an optimization we added, I guess two releases are now, uh, ago now, and we've added further optimizations too. So moving on to um, <clears throat> something new to uh, OpenStack. Pardon me, I got far in my throat. <coughs> and that's not my water. So I'm not going to drink it. Um, shared file systems. So not prior provided for an OpenStack. Problem though is if you kind of view OpenStack as the sort of de facto, and we do, uh, open infrastructure as a service capability. I mean, I think it's established itself as the, the winner, if you will, in open infrastructure as a service. Um, the, about 65% of inf storage infrastructure in the world sold as recently as two years ago. I apologize, I don't have newer numbers was for, to underpin shared file system deployment. And even if that number's changed, it's still a very significant <coughs> portion of the market. And what you don't have within OpenStack is treatment for shared file systems, delivering them as a service. You know, and it's kind of understand, understandable why there's a, quite a lot more complexity involved than there is in delivering something like a block storage service, something we've become very intimate with as we've delivered that capability called Manila. So Manila is more or less what Cinder does, except for, for shared file systems. 
Um, so, and it's built to be agnostic to the file system. So SIFs, NFS, GPFS, you know, GlossFS, you know, you name it, it could be provided for. And in fact, in the process of, is in the process of being provided for, uh, you know, certainly the NFS and SIFs from NAP directly, some of the others from some of the other folks that we've brought in and built a community with. Um, so this is now a formally incubated capability, <clears throat> meaning the OpenStack Foundation Technical Committee has uh, assessed it and it's meet, met all requirements for formal incubation. So it is formally part of the OpenStack fold. This is something that NetApp uh, initially conceived of, designed, prototype, submitted, built community around. And we are continuing to lead. The, the Manila Project Technical Lead is a NetApp employee, for example. Uh, there's a separate session. I'm not going to turn management in more detail. There's a demo and addition for, uh, for more uh, additional info in a subsequent session. I think it's actually the one immediately following this on Manila. So please catch that if you're interested. And by the way, also, you know, hack at the bits, github.com slash openstack slash Manila, if, if you want. It's just a bit about like what we're seeing. So this is, this is numbers that we derive from our auto support capability. So this is if a customer of NetApp desires to, su to supply information to NetApp for support purposes, um, they have, we have a, capability, a phone home capability called auto support that can supply this information to us. Uh, of course, some folks opt out of it. Some folks, um, you know, would prefer not to supply it to us. So this is not, you know, all inclusive, but just as a relatively good representation. And you know, f probably for obvious reasons, I've not included the actual numbers. Wouldn't be appropriate to do so for a variety of reasons, not the least of which we're in kind of a quiet period for reporting our financial results. Um, we've seen a huge, huge ramp just within this um, calendar year. 285% uh, growth in deployed systems and also a huge growth in the number of customers are deploying OpenStack on NetApp. And the only thing we can actually measure with auto support is actually the sender stuff. We, we, you know, and none of the other stuff I talked about is measurable via our auto support. So long story short, this is growing really, really rapidly. That's a pretty, pretty enormous ramp numbers just within this calendar year. And we weren't starting from zero. We were already, per the OpenStack Foundation um, user survey, the most widely deployed commercial uh, storage uh, option for center deployment. Uh, another quick note about the way we actually deploy, or the way we do our integrations, we do by default provide them upstream. You know, it's not to say that, that we can always do so for intellectual property reasons, but when we can, we provide our integrations into upstream OpenStack. And we do that because it's not at all clear to us, <clears throat> or for that matter, so far as we can see anyone else, who ultimately, like, the prevailing options are going to be for distributions of OpenStack. There's a lot of reasons to do it. It provides, you know, freedom, uh, uh, the ability for, you, for folks to actually, like, modify our integrations to taste in your own particular deployment. Uh, more commonly, though, it's just the case that um, some of you may want to deploy uh, Ubuntu, some Rel OSP, some, you know, Nebula, you know, SUSE. It, it goes on. You know, at last count, I think there's something like two dozen different sort of readily identifiable OpenStack distributions, our stuff is in all of them because we are upstream. <clears throat> Just a little bit of a, a, um, a summary of what we've been up to the last two releases. Um, so some of the stuff I talked about already, we delivered our E-Series system enablement for Cinder. I didn't really talk about that, but I, I briefly did. Uh, we also uh, also have the ability to uh, um, stand up E-Series behind Cinder and employ that same storage service catalog construct. We layered in the parallelized NFS stuff at that same time. Uh, that in the uh, offload, copy offload capabilities I mentioned, that was an additional optimization for improved instance creation. It's a new thing in the Ice House release. A big emphasis for, is, for us is in building reference and solution architectures. And so we were just starting down this path. It's going to expand fairly rapidly. Um, a big uh, a goal when we deliver reference architectures to provide accompanying automation in hand. So if we give you something, for example, RHEL OSP and high availability and NetApp, you know, high availability are, are a reference architecture for deployment of, of OpenStack services with a RHEL OSP distribution and NetApp backends. Um, we want to also provide to you the, the appropriate accompanying automation to make it so. So reference architecture could be an interesting reading exercise, but wouldn't it be more useful if you could just, in a simplified manner, deploy it? So that's a, that's a goal is to provide Puppet Manifest and Chef recipes where possible with each of our reference architectures. In Juno, we got Manila incubated, which was not an insignificant effort. 
Um, some of the, uh, the rest of the stuff that you have here is you'll actually see some of our Puppet and Chef enablement for our platform is actually just now rolling out. Um, and we implemented uh, support for a capability we don't have time to get into here called um, um, uh, pools, cinder pools, uh, and, and that dramatically improves behavior on our clustered on tap systems in particular. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff planned for Kilo. If you want to hang around afterwards, we can talk about that in more depth. Um, you know, we, we do partner. I mentioned that we're in any of those different um, distributions. It's not to say that we don't like do explicit partnering activities. It's not an all-inclusive list, but those are certainly some of the folks who are more significant. I guess I forgot to mention MetaCloud. I forgot to remove MetaCloud since they were acquired by Cisco about, a, I don't know, what, a couple months ago. Um, so we have activities in terms of reference architectures with Red Hat and Rackspace. We have ones underway with SUSE. Uh, we, have, we have more to come in this particular respect. And uh, I, I'm particularly interested if there's anyone in the crowd afterwards, um, if you're using something other than Puppet or Chef or configuration management, perhaps an Ansible or Salt, trying to measure like general, gauge general interest on that as well. Um, so this is actually in the process of rolling out, like I mentioned. In fact, actually just two weeks ago, the first Puppet, Puppet device module for Cluster on Tap was made available on Puppet Forge. So that's a, that's a very new thing. So just a little bit, I guess, in summary about Net, uh, OpenStack and NetApp, uh, we are enabling that, that um, high, um, common data fabric across multiple different cloud endpoints, um, which is facilitate you know, hybrid cloud. And that's just, we're just starting down that path. Our announcements around cloud on tap are an example of kind of directionally where we're heading. So there'll be more detail on that here. I apologize if you didn't elaborate, but just to give you a picture of where we see OpenStack relative to that. Um, one of the things that we see a lot of folks doing is using us, uh, you know, a slice of our system in POC. Sometimes we'll use other set of capabilities, perhaps, you know, local disk is used in, in a variety of different capacities, but when it comes time to support production SLAs, uh, oftentimes there's no second conversation about reliable storage, reliable backends, high performance storage. And so, uh, you know, we participate in a lot of POCs, but also we also participate in a lot of activities in, in um, uh, changing the storage back end when it becomes necessary to actually keep the lights on, so to speak. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that we're well integrated in, you know, a hardened capability proven over many years with a lot of additional features is, you know, kind of removes a lot of the risk for, for OpenStack when it in of itself has a lot of moving parts. Um, the fact that you can actually deploy, and we have a number of folks that are doing this, deploy infrastructure for both kind of that cloud native application infrastructure and your classic sort of maybe POSIX belt application infrastructure on a common, efficient, single, inf da uh, proven uh, data uh, infrastructure um, is something that we've seen very, a lot of folks find attractive. Um, <clears throat> it, it seems uh, net inefficient to necessarily have two separate environments for that. And some of the things that we're doing at NetApp are, are aimed at trying to specifically bolster individual um, uh, OpenStack services such that they can be used for more classic application deployment. Again, to support classic, S you know, high SLAs given a different model of application. At the same time, facilitating, uh, you know, that cloud native fully fundamentally distributed application, maybe built of PaaS, that type of thing. We, we are very heavily invested in OpenStack. We were, again, the first to have provided integrations upstream, uh, very active within the Cinder community. Uh, we've led Manila to this day, point. We have more detail in the, sub, in the subsequent Manila session about like essentially the community roadmap that we're helping drive. Um, if you are interested in additional uh, details, netapp.com slash OpenStack is probably the best single place to go. There's a, a particular document there called the NAP OpenStack Deployment and Operations Guide that talks about uh, you know, not just the configuration setup, but ongoing care and feeding, how to do this. This is, I think, in its fifth revision, possibly, maybe it's sixth. Uh, so you can find that there, Twitter, um, and then also for those of you in the development community or deployment community, uh, find us on Freenode, where we're there on IRC, OpenStack-NetApp. Happy to talk with you there. Uh, there's a number of sessions uh, here as well. So um, of course, uh, there was one earlier today. I'm not sure if you're aware, but most of these are recorded. I think all of them, perhaps, and will be available on YouTube later. I'm sorry, I went through these too quickly. Um, there's a, uh, a demo theater, I think it's tomorrow. We have a Manila session, we have a use case showcase session later today. We talk about like some of our particular customers and how they're using OpenStack with NetApp. 
Uh, and likewise, our booth is over here. I think it's on the second floor. So love to have conversations with you, answer any questions you have. We'll, of course, be there in force in Vancouver. So we still have the rest of the weekend here in Paris, but just you know, looking forward to six months. Um, we'll see you there as well. Thank you. And um, I even actually finished a little early. Thank <laughs> you.